It's time for your favorite fitness and entertainment podcast. By the way, we just got ranked. This is true now, right? We did this survey here in the studio between me, Adam, and Justin. Mind Pump was number one in the world, according to us. So this is crazy. Again, backed by our own scientific studies. We only say things that are totally true. Anyway, today's giveaway is a full kettlebell workout for your body. It's called Kettlebell for Aesthetics. This is a lesser known program that we have. It's very popular. And it's a full body workout utilizing only kettlebells, okay? And you get that for free if you do the following and you win from doing the following. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Make it a good comment. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. You have to do all those things. And if we pick your comment, we'll notify you and then you'll get free access to the Kettlebell for Aesthetics program. Also, before we get the show started, there's only four days left for the October special. This is a huge time, a huge month with a huge special. MAPS Anabolic combined with the No BS six-pack formula. Get them both right now for $59.99. Again, this promotion is over in four days, so if you're interested, you have to act right now. If you're interested, head over to mapsfitnessproducts.com. Just don't forget to use the code October, excuse me, don't forget to go to the link mapsoctober.com. So if you go to mapsoctober.com, you can sign up for that incredible promotion. All right, here comes the show. You know, when I was a kid growing up and I would look up like routines and exercises for, for you know, in the bodybuilding magazines mm. for particular body parts. It was always the bodybuilder with the corresponding body part that stood out. Of course. That yeah. was the person that of I course. would listen to. You know what I mean? Do you remember that? Doing yeah, the that's same like thing? marketing 101. I think they did it that way too, yeah. right? It was always, They'd always feature that bodybuilder yeah. on the, mag the magazine cover and then you would know, turn to the center and yes. you'd get the work Who has right? the biggest arms? Yeah. Yes. Boom, yes. right there. Now, the, 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 I did that initially. And then I learned about genetics and, you know, bodybuilders, pro bodybuilders use steroids. And then I thought to myself, it doesn't matter what, you know, these people did for those body parts because they were born that way. But then I kind of came around full circle because when you learn about bodybuilders is, yes, they may have genetic gifts, but that doesn't mean that they ignore those areas. In fact, if anything, especially in early bodybuilding or at least up until the 80s and 90s, they wanted to make body parts stand out. So they, they would be known for, like Arnold was known for his chest or yeah. you know, certain bodybuilders were known for their back or for their biceps. And one thing about these bodybuilders is that they, because these muscles were so developed on them, they had kind of a, a different connection and feel. I'll use myself as an example. If I think of the body parts on my body that respond well, I also know how to connect to them really well. And I also have really good, I think good advice on training them so long as I train them. Right. Well, our, our good buddy, Ben Pakulski, who is also a bodybuilder. Um, he, that was one of the things that I remember when we first started hanging out that he would say a lot was that he believes that most anybody that has a lagging body part or a weak body part, it has everything to do with the poor connection. connection. Yeah. Just, they just lack a good connection there. And so, even though they think they're training it enough or training it correctly because they're doing the exercises that are supposed to develop that. And we've seen this like even in general pop, right? We talk about this all the time. We had an episode just recently where we discussed building the butt. Yeah. And when I think back to the clients that I, sure there was a, a portion of them that had no idea what they were doing, but then there's a go, there was a good portion of people that would come to me and be like, Adam, I'm doing this, 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 yeah. and, there, and they hit all the right exercises um, that they should be doing, but they just had a very poor connection to the glutes and then therefore it wasn't developing. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. So I think it would be fun if we go through bodybuilders and the body parts that they were known for and then what exercises for those body parts they really focused on. Well, I say do the reverse. Let's go through body parts. And then you think of a the bodybuilder that comes to mind that best represents that. Like that's yeah. yeah. So and, and right away, I mean, this w wouldn't be a, a fair episode if we didn't open it with I think the chest. Yeah. And Arnold. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I for mean, sure. I think that's, that's what, the staple of like how much do you bench? I'm sure <laughs> that Arnold had a big part to that. Well, so first off, he was definitely known for his chest. That was a body part that Arnold was like. Everybody, you know, biceps and chest, right? Those are the two body parts he was super known for. Yeah. And there's these famous old photos of him when he would do a his side chest pose, where his up his chest was so developed that they could put like a glass on top of his upper chest. So they could literally <laughs> balance it on his upper chest 
while he was flexing. And then if you watch, you know, Pumping Iron, right, which I, th- I think was shot in 1974, and you see him, there's, you know, uh, videos of him working out, training his chest. There's one where he's doing cable crossovers. You know the one with the freaking surfer dude behind him? Uh, you got to yeah. watch that clip, by the way, in Pumping Iron. There's, like, this surfer dude behind him who's, like, looks like he's totally stoned or whatever. Yeah, Meanwhile, watching Arnold's in doing, awe. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but his chest was just absolutely insane, and it was bench press. Mm-hmm. Bench press was... Arnold's exercise and barbell bench press barbell. That, right I thought I remember hearing him say like that that was always in his routine like there was never a cycle of that being out of his well routine. so here's something special about or unique I think about Arnold was he trained for a sh- or competed for a very short period of time as a power lifter in Europe I, in mm-hmm. fact this is how him and Franco Colombo got to know each other was through power lifting because Colombo was a power lifter also Col- right? Colombo was yeah. and Arnold for a long time in his routine, would throw in, not only was he very consistent with the bench press, but then he would throw in power cycles of bench press where he would just focus on getting strong um, with his bench press. In that in that era, bench press was relatively common and uh, popular, but Arnold made it so that everybody bench press because he was Mr. Olympia seven times, crazy developed chest. And if you look at every single bodybuilder's, almost every single pro bodybuilder's routine back then, it was bench press. And if it wasn't for Arnold, I don't think the bench press would have achieved the level of popularity that it got. Now, was Arnold one of the first to like really tra- – because I know that like Ronnie Coleman's known for this, right? Like training for strength, yeah. even though you're a bodybuilder, right? Versus like focusing on the pump, which is more popular, I think, in the bodybuilding community. Was Arnold one of the first to like really focus on just overall strength for something like bench press? Or no, good? but he, he, was like, he was known more for – his volume, really, I know yeah, that. Yeah, volume and double split routines and lots of angles. But he also valued the strength aspect and would throw in strength cycles. I mean, there was a he, there was a period of time when he all he wanted to do was add an inch to his legs, which you know we could talk about because they were one of his most challenging areas were legs overall. And he would do just a cycle of strength with squats to add uh, an inch to his legs, and and it was successful for him. So he did this. He saw the value in it, but. His routines almost always started with bench press, and of course he would do his inclines and his flies and all that stuff. Well, it was his it was his incline barbell bench press in particular that I remember. I've talked on the show before that I went on this kick for like a couple yeah. years where I, I wanted to live, and I don't know if it was a, a video I watched or an article I read on him, but it was something that I came across related to Arnold. And I, how strong his incline bench was uh, relative to his uh, flat bench, and that was what kind of kicked it off for me because my it, there was huge discrepancy. Like yeah. I was that time, I think I was flat bench for pressing around two twenty five. I'd work out with, and I literally could could barely do like one eighty five on the incline, and so that was like a big thing for me. Is like, can I catch? my incline barbell press up. And I attribute that to some of the most uh, uh, development that I had or gains that ever happened for my chest with, especially like my upper chest. Yeah. Another thing Arnold did was his range of motion. So if you yeah, watch deep, him do flies, uh, deep, he was big on the stretch yeah. and full range of motion with his, with his flies. But definitely what he was most known for with chest was bench press and it, his routine, his chest routine, often started with five sets of bench press. Mm. That was almost always. If you see any routines written about Arnold, his routine would start with five sets of bench, and then he would go on uh, to other exercises. Yeah. So really cool. Yeah. Um, all right, let's talk about back. Right, we got to yeah. go to back. Uh, his training partner Franco, the original like Latzilla, right? The original yeah. back monster. And wasn't he like w- one of the first bodybuilders to make like deadlifting popular? Oh yeah. Oh, he was big on that. Yeah. yeah. I actually remember him lifting cars and like kind of showing yeah, yeah. off and like moving them. And he was just like super strong at deadlifting. So I have a photo in like a like a poster photo that I've had in the gyms that I've owned for probably, I've probably had it for 20 years. It's a signed photo of him. And it's the famous one where he's deadlifting. And I think it's got like six or seven plates on each side. And remember, Franco was a small guy. He was like a hundred and... 90 pounds. He wasn't a mm-hmm. tall dude. And he's pulling it off the ground. And then there's the great Dane sitting next to him. Have you seen this photo? I don't of know him? if I've seen that one. If Doug, if you look up Franco Colombo deadlifting or great, Dane. It's, it's a famous photo. Okay. I have it signed, right? Yeah. He was huge on the deadlift. In fact, uh, Arnold, there's a famous story where Arnold told Franco to impress Weeder with a 700 pound deadlift. And he just pulled 700 pounds off the ground. Oh, wow. Super strong. He was also known for wide grip chin-ups. 
and Franco would grab a really wide grip and he would do these chin-ups. And if you look at a photo of Franco Colombo's lat spread, people need to realize that nobody's back looked like that back then. Now, bodybuilders now, that's it right there. Oh yeah. So yeah. that's the photo that that I that I have up on my I've had up on my wall forever. Yeah, it's yeah all, I've seen that in your garage. Before. Yeah, it's all tore yeah, up yeah, now. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, but he did wide grip chin ups and deadlifts, and deadlifts were not really thought of as a bodybuilder movement. They were a powerlifter. Oh, movement. it's still yeah. it's funny to me because that's one of the things that's in our space right now. And it's more often than not I see that these guys trying to make a case and or trying to say that uh, deadlifting is not a back exercise. And I just think it's so funny. Here we are. I mean, you, I, none of that was talked about before. And here you are picking uh, Columbo's back as one of the best. And one of the things that he was most known for was his heavy deadlifting. Yeah. Now, routine. I want to mention another bodybuilder uh, on when it comes to back. Actually, two bodybuilders because there are two others that really stand out. So Franco definitely stood out. Uh, and then Dorian Yates was on another level in the 90s. I mean, he busted out his – He when he won the Olympia, he came out, and he, when he would turn around, it was lights out. That's why they called him the shadow. That was his nickname because he, like, cast a shadow on people because his back was so wide. <laughs> he was known for supinated grip barbell rows. You know what's funny about this, by the way? Mm. Nobody did supinated grip barbell rows. That's oh, really? strange because it seems like such a natural way to do it. You know, like, uh, just – yeah. Turn your grip and and getting that underhand grip. It, it actually even feels better to me oh, personally. It forces the elbows in. Yeah, yeah. You get that squeeze and squeeze out of it. And he did it kind of at a forty five degree angle, mm. so he wasn't completely parallel to the ground. He also popularized hammer strength equipment. So remember, hammer strength was just coming onto the scene. Yeah, and then they showed videos of you know uh, Yates doing the you know ISO row. And that was really the first plate loaded kind of equipment became mm -hmm. really popular. And then of course we have to mention Ronnie Coleman, which probably the best, most widely, you know, best developed back of all time. Also and big deadlifter, big deadlifter. Dude. <laughs> That's that famous video of him deadlifting 800 pounds. You yeah. Like a that? week or two out from, from the <laughs> yeah, show. Dude. That's, that's crazy to me. Cause you know, uh, you, when you're that, when you're that far into a cut, like you're like so depleted. The last couple weeks of, of training heading into a show is you're just going through the motions. You're just trying to survive. And I think this dude was pulling 800 pounds deadlifting is insane. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. doesn't make any sense. What you'll notice with these heavy deadlifters, by the way, is the thickness in the mid back. Like they all have the, wide the backs. The columns. The columns, dude. Dorian, there's a photo of Dorian waiting to go on stage and he's kind of like leaning forward and someone had a camera and took it from behind and it looked like quads. It looked like he had two quads on his back. It was just <laughs> insane. And then, of course, Coleman, I mean, it was just uh, didn't make any sense. Yeah, there's the photo of uh, Oh, wow. Of he is way upright. Yeah, so he did kind of like this 45-degree angle. I see you doing it all the time and I think you're just being a wuss. That's what I thought, oh, but no, you were no. actually I'm trying to get Dorian Yates back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, he's, he's really... Uh, He's really upright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, wow, that's that's interesting how upright yeah, he is. Yeah, you really you got to focus on squeezing the lats right there and yeah. pulling the shoulder and you you will get a pretty crazy lat pump from doing it that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty pretty uh pretty fun. So yeah, Coleman deadlifts, Dorian Yates deadlifts, Franco Colombo deadlifts. I think they all have something in common. Yeah. yeah. It, what's interesting about this, you don't see a lot of uh, bodybuilders deadlift anymore. So is it is it more that the judging has changed? No. Or no. is it that they just uh, it's, don't prefer to It's go. coming back, by the way. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All He's, you have, what's his, you brought up, what's his name? Seabum, uh, right? Yeah. So he he's a big deadlifting guy, which, but, and oh, by the way, one of the best bodies yep. right now in bodybuilding. Yep. So. And you're starting to see now, I don't remember his name. He just won the Arnold Classic, new guy, deadlifts all the time like like people they're they're rediscovering the power of the deadlift for back development and i've said this a million times like nothing comes close and i know people argue it all the time but i swear i look this is from experience not just myself but training clients it just develops back like nothing else well we went on this kick of uh you know, the deadlift increases the size of your waist and then these, you know, guys yeah. wearing the corsets. And so that that was big and popular. And then there's this movement of, oh, that doesn't, it's technically not a back exercise. Mm -hmm. So the combination of those two things, I think is why it fell out of favor in uh, with training with bodybuilders. But I agree. I think it's making its way back. And in my opinion, it's very obvious when I see someone turn around and do a back pose. 
I feel like I can tell right away, like you if know they're a deadlifter or not. Which I, there's not a lot of exercises somebody could pose and I go, oh, he does that or he doesn't do that. You could tell. Deadlifting is one of those things where I feel like if you're a major deadlifter and you turn around and see back, it's like, oh yeah, he deadlifts. Or if they don't at all, to me, it's it's very obvious. My my good buddy, like, uh, and and not to throw him under the bus, but I think he's got an amazing physique. He just did a great. He just had a show, uh, Johnny Sebastian. He's been on here before. And he just, he won't deadlift in, in fear of putting on there. But when he turns, is, to me, that's the only reason why the dude doesn't win shows all the time is his back. He's got mm -hmm. an incredible physique from top to bottom. And he turns around and he has a back that looks like it doesn't deadlift mm -hmm. ever. And I, he's missing that thickness and the columns. Like it just, and, and all out of fear of putting on you know what's the thickness interesting of the waist. about that is that having a wider waist will probably make you better at squatting and deadlift. So sometimes you see power lifters and strength athletes really good at deadlifting yeah. and squatting and you think it's what gave them the thicker waist. No, they were it's that the thicker waist probably gives you better leverage. But here's the irony of that. So Ronnie Coleman, Dorian Yates, Franco Colombo, look at all of their front and rear lat spreads. The difference between their lats and their waist is dramatic. Do they have these wide, blocky waists in comparison now? Well, that's the case I made back. We talked about this a, a while back with because one of the fears I, I would get, especially with CrossFitting becoming so popular, there's a lot of girls that uh, are really good at deadlifting. They also have kind of a wider, boxier waist. Yeah. But it's they had a wider, boxier waist, and, and it that made them. Well. And it led the yeah, it lent itself well to them deadlifting. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that they deadlifted a lot and then they got a boxy waist. You know what it's that. like? It's like mm -hmm. saying bench pressing heavy is going to give you short arms and a barrel chest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, yeah. or deadlifting well is going to make you tall and lanky. Like those yeah. body part, like those body types, like the best deadlifters typically have long, kind of yeah, long torso. The leverage lends itself yeah. well for those lifts. Yeah, benchers really short arms, right? Yeah. So. That's absolutely what it is. And developing a big waist from deadlifting, no, don't worry about that. And if you did gain, by the way, a quarter inch on your waist, which is nothing, you would it would be offset by the three inches that you gain around your lats and your back that you got, you know, from the deadlifts. All right. So shoulders. Talk about shoulders, which in my opinion, I think shoulders are for both sexes. Aesthetically speaking, probably one of the most important body parts. Wouldn't right. you agree? No, I agree. It's been uh, it was one of the biggest uh, difference makers for um, my physique. I've talked on the show before about the first critique I read. I had a, a female bodybuilder when I was like 22. I had her critique my physique, and uh, her exact words: "Well, oh, you have weak shoulders." Yeah. <laughs> 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 <I> fucking. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but it sent me on a mission after yeah. that was to develop them. And, you know, it was crazy because at that time in my life, I was coming out of, you know, being a teenage boy who trained his arms, you know, nine times a week. And that's all it buys and tries like crazy because I wanted impressive arms. And the irony is that uh, my I put, I put so much focus on my shoulders, the same kind of focus I was probably doing in my arms before that. Uh, my arms shrank, so the, the the circumference of my arms was much smaller, uh, but my delts changed, and people would think I had bigger, better arms. Yeah, and it's like no, I think just the shoulder really. Not only does it make the arm look amazing, it also pulls. I mean, it makes you get that oh, yeah, V. You get wide. Yeah, you get wide, and it makes your waist look even more narrow. And women, just, it gives them the sculpted arm look. Yeah. Oftentimes, they think, "Oh, your arms look amazing," and what they're really talking about is their shoulders. shoulders. Yeah, that definition. One hundred percent. So, one bodybuilder, not as well known, but he was so the original Arnold Schwarzenegger Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, which I've referred to before. So, the first kind of you know muscle building exercise book I ever had. In there, Arnold highlights uh, Bertel Fox. He's a UK bodybuilder. Uh, by the way, uh, went to jail for murdering someone. So let's just forget that for a second. Oh <laughs> shit! Really? Yeah, he did. I didn't. Yeah, know that. in the in the 90s, I think. This is why we don't idolize. Still in prison? I I'm, think so. I think oh so. wow! He was now they called him Bertel Brutal Fox. I guess he he lived up to his nickname because of the way he trained. He trained like a madman, heavy or whatever. But what he was known for was his delt development, and he was known for the behind the neck press oh. and he was strong yeah, he'd, he'd work up to 250 pounds 10 reps seated behind the neck press now i know more recently the behind the neck press is like a dirty word oh don't mm -hmm. do that it's bad for your shoulders or whatever i want to say i do want to say this all exercises are appropriate so long as you could do them with good control and stability so right. there is no bad exercise there's just exercises that you may not be able to perform with good control and good stability so that being said, if you have good control and good stability, 
the benefits of the behind the neck press really have to do with just the form and technique that's required for you to bring the barbell behind your head without having to jut your head forward and have this weird. Mm -hmm. If you could do this with good posture, it's almost like you're squeezing your delt just to hold that position and then you press. And if you can do them well, the shoulder pump you get from a behind yeah, the neck press you, is insane. Yeah, what do you think it is insane. about that that attributes to the development of shoulder so much? Because when you think about a military press, we're only talking about the difference of four, maybe six inches, you know, from direct, yes. you know, right? You know what I'm saying? It's not like it, like, is it really, is it really doing that much more? Or do you think it has something to do with the fact that you are having to engage and to get them back in hell of yeah. a position? Think mm -hmm. about that. Like even now, if you're just trying to hold them back like in this position. back and yeah. isolating Or it. is it possibly too that when you're at that angle, the rear delt is taking a lot of the load versus when it's in front of you, the you upper chest, chest, the upper involved. chest gives you. So in a deep shoulder press all the way down, your upper chest gets a lot of that. Gets a little bit of activation. Yeah, and, yeah, and versus if I'm like in this, when I'm in a stretch position on the chest and the bar's behind my head and it's all the way down, I'm not really feeling much of my chest. Now I actually feel more in my delt, in my rear delt mm -hmm. when I'm at the bottom there to get it up right. out of the out of the hole. Yeah, this, this was a very, the behind the neck press was a staple in bodybuilding routines for a while. Bertle Fox, again, was known for it, but then in the 90s, People like Kevin Lavrone, you know, and uh, and bodybuilders. That's, that's what they did. In fact, very few bodybuilders did uh, military press. Military presses weren't in bodybuilding routines for a, for a little while there. Yeah, it was all behind the neck. It was it went from military press to behind the neck back to military press. There's always this kind of like back and forth. But there's value in both, and if you can do them well. They don't feel the same. They don't feel the same as a standard overhead no, press. No, they feel different. And I want to caution the audience because, um, you know, I, w I think at that time I was able to military press like 225 and I had to go all the way down to the bar yeah. with behind the neck. So now, my, now, And just holding in position, you probably got a crazy shoulder. Oh, I, I, that's mm -hmm. why I think I, I think I enjoyed it right away because even though it was way lighter than what I could military press, the first time I ever did it, just controlling the reps, slow and controlled for 10 to 15 reps with just the 45-pound bar gave me this massive pump in my shoulder. And I thought, oh, wow, this is – if I'm at 45 pounds right now and I feel this, and I did, I just – I kept working my way up like 10 pounds out of a t at a time. It took me about a summer of focusing on that before I had really – and, of course, a lot of work on the shoulder mobility mm -hmm. to get there. Um, but, yeah, no, I saw a huge improvement. Yeah, from and that. I think part of it, too, is when you're doing any kind of a press, you want your elbow under your hand, right? So if it's in front of my body, elbow in front of my hand. But now when I move behind my neck, I have to really bring my elbow back to stay in front, uh, excuse me, underneath my hand. Otherwise, it turns into this kind of a press, and that's where shoulders uh, problems start to happen. Yeah. So holding everything back, it's that contraction of squeezing back and holding mm -hmm. that position, I think, is what changes the feel. And I go light. I don't go super heavy on behind the neck. I just try to keep my elbows under my hands and squeeze the whole time. And it's a different feel. Such a perfect primer to complement that is our zone one test. It's yes. literally that, like that was like my go-to. Yes. And I, I think maybe that's actually what made me do that was I was working on our zone one test because I had my forward head and forward, forward shoulder was the worst of all the tests that we took. And I was like working on that so much. I thought, you know what? I should do an exercise that promotes that in yeah. addition to working on my priming. And so complementing those together, doing the zone one wall test, mm -hmm. and then going into that exercise is a perfect combo. Oh, it's a uh, it's a phenomenal exercise. It's what, it, one of my favorites. But again, it's about form and technique and feel. And it definitely feels different. In fact, you know who does a lot of behind the neck presses? Here's This is something funny. It's this, There's a certain strength athlete that is not a bodybuilder, they don't present their physique for people to look at, that performs behind the neck presses. Olympic lifters. Oh, yeah. Olympic lifters do, now when you when you do a snatch. They do even or, push presses from behind the neck. Behind the neck. Yeah. If you've ever seen them, they'll literally catch the barbell mm -hmm. on their traps and press. And people, oh, you shouldn't do it, it's bad for your shoulder. Uh, Olympic lifters, they have pretty healthy shoulders and typically if they hurt themselves, it's not their shoulder that they, en they end up injuring. So if you have the control and the mobility, it's not. It's a great exercise. Uh, well, it's even to get their shoulders and set in position in a snatch in an overhead yes. position. They have to have that ability to keep it uh, stabilized in, like that with their shoulders. So uh, to to be able to kind of bring it down and back behind their neck is a natural thing to to work on to stabilize that position with your shoulder. Well, I think that's the takeaway from this, right? So if you're somebody who can't perform it comfortably. 
it's a good goal. Mm -hmm. And that's how it ended up in my routine was I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it with good form. And it's something that I don't want to lose that ability to be able to press something like that. It should be very natural for the body to do that. So if you try this and you're and you're terrible at it, don't just abandon it because you're not good or you're not strong. Mm -hmm. at it. Um, it's only going to benefit you to work on the mobility to be able to uh, behind the neck press and it'll benefit not only your shoulders but just overall shoulder health. Yep, yep, absolutely. All right, let's go to the let's go to the legs. Uh, we'll start with the quads, and I would say quads and hamstrings for this person, but quads in particular. Now, here's what's interesting about the guy that we're about to talk about. If I if we ever bring up a bodybuilder from the 70s or 80s, you typically have to judge their body or the body part in the context of that era because bodybuilders are so much bigger now, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's largely due to the amount of drugs yeah. that they use, uh, the amount of steroids and growth hormone and stuff like that. Like like Arnold, I think, competed at 220. Today, a guy his height would compete close to 300 pounds. Just give you an example of right. the difference in size, right? But this particular bodybuilder, his legs then, you put him on a pro bodybuilder stage today. Still bigger. And he would still have in, in, incredibly impressive uh, quad development, Tom Platts. Tom Platts, if you look up his legs and his quads, his quads even today would totally stand out. And he's also known as one of the best barbell squatters of all time. Deep, the, too. Per, his form was so good. Do you guys ever watch the video of him? I think he was competing with Tom Hatfield. You guys know who Tom Hatfield was? Mm -hmm. First man to squat over 1,000 pounds. And they did like a squat competition. Oh, I didn't know that. To see who could squat. I think it was 500 pounds more times. Oh, wow. And Tom Platts blew him out. And then Tom Platts has done things like he would squat 135 for 30 minutes. So he would just put 135 on. <laughs> just keep going. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, 30 minutes of squats with, yeah. with 135. Okay. His form was impeccable, and his routine oftentimes was all squats. He would do squats with his wide stance, close stance, heels elevated, like all different variations of squats developed. Look at the, look at his quads right there. It's insane. Like it's just Holy now his it, it, and his hamstrings too, dude. Well, let's get to the hamstr we'll get to the hamstrings next, but let's talk about his quads first. He was again all about squats. And if you watch videos of him squatting, what you will see are the most perfect looking squats you've ever seen in your yeah. entire life. I, I I don't I've never seen a squat better uh, than Tom Platt's. Now hamstrings, he also had tremendous hamstring development and the keys with him with hamstrings were his range of motion was insane so uh tom platts could get into like a half split he could fold himself all the way in half he was one of the first bodybuilders to prove that having muscle was okay for flexibility mm -hmm. and he did these stiff-legged deadlifts with uh with with his spine staying neutral so it was like almost like a romanian deadlift but he would stand on a bench so that the plates could go further than the bench. Oh and God, really oh what wow. his thing was, was range of motion, yeah. stiff-legged deadlifts. And there's famous photos of him like bending over and showing his hamstrings. And it's like, it looks like an anatomy chart. Wasn't he also the one who, who uh, made sissy squats really yes. popular? Yes. Yeah. He was I, a very big sissy And that was something guy. completely foreign to me until we met. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I remember the first time that you showed me a sissy squat and I thought it was ridiculous. I was like, this is the <laughs> stupidest. I really did. I thought this was like the stupidest exercise ever. I, I thought it was silly. And, and part of that was I, I didn't know how to do it properly. So mm -hmm. I think the way that, um, the, obviously, form is always important. But in, in an exercise like that, uh, I think it's even more important on understanding the cues that you should be doing and keeping your kind of your hips in that, in that locked position when you, when you go back. But talk about an amazing uh, quad pump. I just it's now forever been in my in my leg routine always. Now. Yeah. When I did sissy squats, I was like never touching leg extensions again. ever again. Yeah. Ever again. Why? It, it's such a it's such a but it's such a better movement for muscle hypertrophy and what it promotes for ankle mobility, yes. hip control, and yes. strength. Like. It just it it, prom it promotes so many other good things, and then the fact that if your main goal is to just to develop your quads, uh, you know I take the Pepsi challenge all day on it that it's better than your you know yeah. leg extension or any other exercise. Like the only that. downside to sissy squats is they're way harder. So like I wouldn't be able to do that with like a beginner or you, you have to have a decent amount of strength and stability to do it. Yeah, but you know because you could put the leg extension on you know thirty pounds and most people could do it. But if you can do them and you can do them well, I mean, they don't come, like, nothing comes close. No isolation movement for the quads, in my opinion, comes close. You to could the also, quads. though, I mean, obviously like a beginner, beginner, probably not the greatest movement to probably teach them first. But even somebody who's fairly new, 
you can assist with the squat rack or with the I've used the that's how I do it yeah or the suspension trainer yeah. so there's a lot of ways to like assist yourself uh, with that exercise so it's not like you're just doing your body weight not everybody can handle that right away but man if you're not if that's not in your routine your leg routine mm -hmm. uh, you're you're missing out on a great a movement all right let's get to the uh, the show muscle the one you know what's funny about the bicep if somebody comes up to you and says show me your muscle yeah you instinctively know it's the bicep. You know what I mean? It's not, <laughs> Why is that though? I don't know. It's the easiest one to flex. Is I that mean. what it is? Yeah. yeah. Is that necessarily true though? Is it, it really the easiest one for everyone to flex? Bro, is that what it is? It's the show muscle. I think like, so. you know how many bodybuilding poses involve the bicep? You know what I mean? Where you're showing the bicep. I know, but somehow? it's just so funny to me that, that that's, I mean, why this is interesting to me too is like we literally, Max has just learned how to flex. Oh, right? so, yeah. So we've taught him what like, show moment. us, we say, show us your muscles. And he, you know he does he does this little thing. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like intuitive. Yes, you know? that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting at. It's like it's not like I said, son, flex your bicep, and I showed him what that means. It's just you know, show us your muscles, and then it just intuitively it becomes the bicep. But if you're all show me your muscles, son, he does a lap. Yeah, it's because yeah. yeah, he squeezes butt. <laughs> yeah, he just, he's, he's, this is like, let me show you my glutes. Dad. <laughs> yeah. yeah, So biceps are have have all, has been known for a long time as like the the show muscle, right? Again, that's the one that people flex when they say, show me your muscle. Well. We know now bodybuilders, especially pro bodybuilders, have these really big arms. But the first bodybuilder to ever have over 20-inch arms, which is massive. That's massive. Like, I, my arms have never – I've never gotten my arms over 17 and a half inches relatively lean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's still pretty good. It's not bad. 18-inch arms are huge. 20-inch arms are gigantic. Some guns. And the first bodybuilder ever to do this was Leroy Colbert. And it was in the 19... I want to say, maybe, Doug, you can look him up. Uh, I don't even when know who that is. 1950s or 60s. What was he known oh, for? Wow. He was known for his arms. No, no, I mean, like, what exercise was he known oh, for? Oh, he did... So, heavy barbell curls. Okay. And he did it like a strength exercise. So, he'd go six to eight reps with oh, the barbell curl. Interesting. So, really getting his biceps strong. And then he was big on drag curls. Oh, yeah. was he one of the first to do that? I don't know if he was one of the first, but it was usually in his routines. If yeah. you would read about his, there he is right there. And I mean, you can see like, especially for the era, mm. does it say what the era was, Doug? Yeah, the 1950s. 19, do you know how crazy that so, is? natural guy right here. Yeah, well, or like, you know, what would they take in the 50s? Like, you know, five, 10 milligrams of D-ball. Yeah, some, some yeah, oh, in the 50s they had D-ball going around? I didn't know that. I think D -ball, I thought D-ball didn't hit the scene until like Arnold days. No, maybe Doug, you can look up uh, Diana Ball. I think it was the 50s or 60s. Oh, wow. I want to say 50s it was, maybe. Oh, wow, it's been around that long. Yeah. I the, didn't know that. Yeah, just a little side, little side conversation. Conversation. It, the U.S. scientists develop it, developed it in response to the Soviet athletes, mm. obviously doing something. So he created. I also ball. thought that was like in the seventies, wasn't that? Nineteen fifty-eight. Yeah, oh right, wow! Well, yeah. I heard like even like Babe Ruth in that era, like they had a performance-enhanced drugs, methamphetamines. Were, yeah, methamphetamines. Yeah, he was too, using greenies and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that what he was doing? Yeah, they were doing meth. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Not steroids. It didn't help his appetite, though. I he mean, he doing. didn't look like a specimen. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, but okay. So nineteen fifties, probably natural. If he did take anabolic steroids, what they had back then was like literally like creatine like they didn't have anything and here he is this guy with 21 inch arms which was insane yeah but again barbell curls and he did them for strength and drag curls let's start with the barbell curl if you have a good connection to your biceps and you can train them relatively heavy i mean it is it is the mass builder yeah. uh, of the biceps for sure you guys ever do drag curls as part of your routine though i you know i do yeah, and i haven't in a long were. time though and this just this episode is making me want to add that in the routine because it's been a while since i've done them it's a weird squeeze at the top it burns the crap so i so like you leaning over a bench like, no 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 these again i don't you're, even remember you're, you're, the pulled, you're pulled back it's like you pull the shoulders back why i like it and i actually used to teach it because uh, one of the hardest things when you're teaching a client to do bicep curls, the, one of the tendencies they have is to to rock and yeah, the yeah, shoulders yeah. roll forward, uh -huh. and, the, and the the anterior delt takes over a lot of the movement. And I'm always trying to teach to get them to retract mm -hmm. and squeeze. So doing a drag curl promotes that because they cut you you, yeah. you you retract and you pull back as you do kind of the curl. So it's actually a great exercise for so for trainers that are watching this. I like teaching drag curls to even newbies because mm -hmm. it's just, a, it, it gets them in that, that shoulder retracted position that you want to try and keep them in when doing traditional curls anyway. So yeah. I so like think it. of it this way. It's mm. like you starting a barbell curl, 
but then the barbell stays, it drags up your body as you curl. Oh, uh, so you're just pulling it up. So you have to, you're, you're curling, but your elbows go back at the yeah. same time. So it creates this, it's this interesting angle at the top where the bicep lengthens, but also shortens at the bottom. And it's mm. a very interesting, I actually had Doug do them. Didn't you do them the other day when I showed you? Mm -hmm. What'd you think of them? I liked them. Yeah. yeah. It's exactly the reason you talked about, just keeping the That's shoulders right. retracted and, and pulling up. That's what bicep. I found more than anything was that doing it because it exaggerates that, that movement of pulling back like that, it would get my clients to hold that position better. And so it actually became it's, like it's a, hard a pretty regular exercise that I put in for beginner clients that you wouldn't think of that because mm -hmm. it's kind of a bodybuilder type of exercise. But I really like it for that it's reason. It's a hard to cheat exercise and it makes your biceps burn. Like yeah. it creates a pain in the biceps. Great like another exercise. All right, let's talk about the triceps. Uh, one of my, as a kid, one of my favorite bodybuilders of all time was Kevin Lavrone. The guy mine, had mine just, too. you too? Yeah, yeah. Ridiculous arms, shoulders, everything. But his triceps were insane. He was known for being strong as well as you know looking aesthetic and one of his favorite exercises for triceps were heavy close grip bench presses one of the best ones uh that you could possibly do for triceps it was one of uh you know i think it was muscle and fitness that used to do the center of it with their routine or whatever it was his arm routine it was that exercise mm -hmm. uh that i started to do close grip before that it was never uh, an exercise for me that i really did mm -hmm. that on in fact i actually thought it was just a variation for the chest and I never liked doing it mm -hmm. um, until I saw it in his arm routine and I followed that arm routine and nothing blew my triceps up more than that exercise, which I think is also funny because that's another one of those exercises like the deadlift one that people like to argue with us about yes. that's not for the back. Mm -hmm. I actually hear people try and make the argument that close grip bench press is terrible for your triceps, yeah, which I think is fucking hilarious. Yeah. It's one of the best exercises you could do for your triceps. Yeah, I, I, I would always think that the only way to really like emphasize the triceps was to get like add weight to, to heavy dips and like get lower. Mm. And, and it wasn't until I started doing the close grip bench press where I could load it substantially and uh yeah because i was in that same boat i thought like well maybe this is a variation of a chest press yep. but it really did like take my triceps to a different level i was just going to ask you justin because you're a big bencher and of, of, of the three of us i think you have the highest bench press uh i know you've hit four plates before uh -huh. um and did the close grip bench press help with that oh yeah that yeah. took my extension especially like uh the, which is where i would struggle the most because i would be able to get you know, about halfway with, with like the real heavy weight. And then it was just that last bit. I was such a grind. And mm. so once I really started to focus on close grip, it, that, that last bit of extension, that lockout, got, lockout yeah, got yeah. a lot stronger. Now here, here's a tip. Uh, don't go too, too close. Yeah. I, this is the big mistake I made when I first did it. And that'll yeah. mess up your wrist. Line up your shoulders. Yeah. Close grip is literally about shoulder width yeah. and, and you want that elbow, elbow like right flexion in line with your ribs. Yeah. And extension. I like, I like a little bit wider, better, like you're saying than too narrow because too narrow naturally flares the elbows. Yes. Yeah. And you're going to get more of the triceps if you can get the triceps underneath the wrist. So it looks more like that versus real close. And then the elbows yeah. flare. Oh, out. and that'll mess up Keep your wrist, dude. I hurt my wrist doing this and I couldn't do it for a little yeah. while. And then I, I, a buddy of mine's like, dude, just grab a little wider. And now, like, I don't oh remember God. if he was known for this, but my personal spin on this was incline. Yeah, I've, I've never seen that before except for you. And, and I, it's great. It just, it, it puts you in, a, I guess, a better position. It just feels more comfortable, more comfortable, more natural to do this exercise and I don't feel like I lose any any uh, of tri tricep activation by I going I feel like it's ankle. it's easier to have better form with it. I do too. Yeah. I, I think that it's just the way it, it's uh, lined up um, with your body. It also rolls kind of the shoulders back on because your, your back is on an incline. So I almost always do them on an incline. Mm -hmm. I find that even better. All right, let's go to calves. Now, we already mentioned this bodybuilder and we're going to bring him up again because... Not necessarily because he had the best calves of all time, although towards the end of his career, he was known for having incredible calves. But rather, this is a rare case where he went from, he was a pro bodybuilder, or at least very competitive, and he went from having terrible calves to having amazing calves. Like the difference in his calf development in, in that period of time was so impressive, and it's Arnold. Arnold was known for having terrible calves, and I, then he was known for having amazing calves. I love that you mm. picked him because uh, I'm sure you're going to get a little pushback because there's bodybuilders that are more known for their calves that have bigger had bigger calves than him. But what I think is so impressive is like maybe people don't know this or not, but Arnold used to take pictures 
like it's standing in the water and stuff. He's talked about this where he never to wanted, hide them. Yeah, to hide his calves because his his calves were um, underdeveloped compared to the rest of his body. So it was an area that he was kind of insecure about. And so the fact that he went from having really bad calves to having some of the most impressive calves, I think that speaks even more volumes than the guy who just already had kind of massive totally. calves. Totally. And when you read about the story, so here, the sto so the story goes that Arnold got criticized for having small calves. Now, he's known for having incredible work ethic and all that stuff. So what he did to get himself to psychologically dedicate himself to calf training was he cut all the bottom of his sweats off. So no, he stopped walking that. around with his calves covered and mm -hmm. would expose them all the time. And then this would expose him to ridicule. So he'd go to the gym and then bodybuilders so would funny. poke fun at his calves. I did the same shit. That's hella funny. This would keep him motivated. He wrote, <laughs> yeah. he wrote about this. He went to go train with Reg Park. I didn't know this. Yeah, it's true. This is what he wrote about. So tr uh, Reg Park was known for, uh, he was one of the biggest, most well-developed bodybuilders of the 60s. And Arnold uh, in fifties, I think, and Arnold was like a big, uh, like it, he was one of Arnold's heroes. He went to go train with Reg Park, and Reg Park was known for having nice calves. And Reg Park said, "You want bigger calves? You better train them more often with more volume, really full range of motion." And so Arnold just prioritized his calves like crazy, and they grew like crazy. And then one exercise in particular he was known for doing was the donkey calf raise. Dude, I, I love that you share this story because you're making me laugh right now. I didn't know that. And this is, and I don't think I've ever shared with you guys. This was a strategy for me, um, especially when I first obviously got into competing and I'm showing my physique, right? So uh, I, I cared more than ever about this stuff. And my calves were, have always been terrible. And so I was like, instead of hiding them in sweats, I'm going to wear shorts. And what that did was I was so embarrassed of how small they were <laughs> that it always made me lift them first. Yeah. So, I, cause I wanted to have a pump in them at least. I'm like, I'm going to walk around the gym for the next hour. Like I got to get some air in these fucking things. So <laughs> they don't look so terrible. <laughs> so it was a great, I'm serious. And this worked for me because I, I couldn't hide them. If I was in sweats, uh, maybe I'll hit them today. Maybe I won't. Hit them. If I was in shorts and I walked in the gym, it's like, I got to go get some air in these things as soon as I can. And so it increased the frequency that I would train my calves because I would make myself wear shorts to the gym all the That's time, even story. in the winter time. So I've never heard that about him and I've never shared that on mind pump before, but that's the truth. And it helped me. It helped me to make sure that I would hit him. They became an exercise that I, or exercise that I always did first hmm. before anything else, which we've talked about that before. Yes. You say that all the time. Say one of the best ways to bring up a lagging body part is simply just order it as first, one the, first and anything else. Well, that was one of the ways that I ensured that, that even if I wasn't in the mood, I knew I'm walking in the gym with my shorts Dude. and they were <laughs> Did not well, look good unless they were aired up. So the difference between your when you were training and when Arnold was training is now you have access to donkey calf raise machines. Which is one of my favorite. Yes. Back then, they- So it, wait, okay. For all us non-bodybuilder enthusiasts, so that's uh, it. it's the one where you push your butt up. You're bent the, over. It's the one that he's famous for, for stacking two girls on his back. Okay. You've seen that before where he's that. on a block of wood. Yeah. He's got two girls sitting on his back and he's leaning over. Well, like, that was, you like know, it's funny. forward and then coming up. That was for like fun video and stuff, but really it was just his buddies. So Franco and a bunch of bodybuilders. <laughs> yeah. It's true. Yeah. Would sit on his yeah. back. Not as cool of a picture. But that's a famous no. picture though, right? Yes. Like you've seen that before where there's two, there's two, you know, pretty, it's probably a photo show. There's two pretty girls that are like sitting on his back and he's doing yeah, the, the okay. donkey calf so raises. Yeah. Yeah. Fa right, famous. Now, donkey calf raises. Is it the stretch that yes. it puts him in that makes him, why Dude, it works so good? I mean, I nothing stretch. There's that, look at that photo. That's oh, with, uh, <laughs> is that Frank? Oh, he that's. does so have his friends on him. Yeah, it's Franco <laughs> and somebody else. The, the stretch you get on in your gastrox, the big part, the meaty part of the calf. Yeah. You don't get, you could stretch your calf on a standing calf raise and then try to bend at the hips because there's a part of your calf that stretches when you bend over as well because of where it attaches at, at the femur. You will get the most gnarly calf stretch you've ever had in your entire life with doing a donkey calf raise. And for me personally, I mean, we don't have a donkey calf raise machine. Standing, standing calf raises are fine. Nothing, nothing hits my calves like like a donkey. Yeah, you know, I you know, I love donkey calf race. Yeah, it's one sure. of my absolute favorites, and he was definitely very known for him. All right, let's get to abs or the midsection. Now, here's the funny thing about abs: a lot of the same exercises that bodybuilders did, and so you know, I was thinking, what bodybuilder was kind of known for their midsection or for something different? Uh, Frank Zane. Frank Zane was known for his infamous vacuum pose. Oh, yeah. This is with his hands behind his... There it is right there. Look at that. Yeah. Hands behind his head. 
he would suck in his waist to the point where it looked like he had no organs. Like it literally was like thin and you would see a serratus interior and everything develop. And it became the kind of this classic bodybuilder pose that bodybuilders don't even do today because I think their guts and everything's so big. Now. It's actually making its way back, mm. especially in classic uh, bodybuilding, yes, right? So yes. you, in the, in the classic category, the vacuum pose is now making its way back as one of the popular poses. I like it for average people. Totally. Um, as advice to help them when they come to you and say, I want to flatten my stomach. Uh, because a lot of times they, they just have such a weak core that it, everything's just kind of hanging out. And just by you training this exercise, you tighten that in. The TVA. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And even without technically losing a bunch of body fat, you'll bring the midsection in like an inch or so just by strengthening those core muscles. This was my secret exercise for uh, new moms. When they would come to me after having a baby and they're working out and obviously they're at the point now where they're training and they're like, you know... I'm, I'm, I'm lean and I'm, I'm exercising, but I just can't, my midsection just, it kind of pooches out a little bit at the bottom. And I'd be like, well, we need to train your TVA. And I'd have them do vacuum poses on their hands and knees with a little bit of resi what, resistance from gravity. And I remember we, we, when we would first start doing them, it's like they couldn't even turn the muscle on. Yeah. But then as they were able to turn it on and suck their midsection in, it would tighten their midsection and they would get, they would lose you know, a, a half an inch around their waist without getting any leaner because yeah. they strengthen uh, this particular muscle. So it's a very functional oh, yeah. exercise. It helps you brace too. I mean, this is something that you want to teach uh, your clients as a trainer too, to be able to support your spine better and get that type of uh, active support. So, uh, you know, the, the drawn in maneuver is something we used to call it, but yeah, for sure. The vacuum pose Great exercise uh, to teach for all kinds of reasons. There Absolutely. You. And if you learn how to vacuum and you have that control and then you train your abs, your obliques, what you can do, and this is more of an advanced technique, as you're doing your crunch, yeah, draw you simultaneously do a little bit of that vacuum draw in and you'll feel everything turn on like you've never felt before. So this is part of why I like the the perfect sit up as one of my favorite exercises because I think you you naturally do that if, yeah. because you have to roll up and in order to do that slow and controlled You do have to vacuum a little bit. You got to mm -hmm. vacuum and you have to draw in that TVA before you start to roll up and that's why I think that's such a great exercise too but yeah that's one of those movements that um, not a lot of people do that and to Justin's point um, have other benefits than just the aesthetics, right? I mean, there's a lot of value in being able to control those muscles for overall health. Totally. So there you have it. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our free guides. We wrote a lot of guides that can help you build bigger muscles or a stronger body or burn more body fat or get better at squatting. We even have guides for personal trainers. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at mindpumpjustin. I'm at Mind Pump Sal, and Adam is at Mind Pump Adam. Hey, look, if you like that whole episode, click right here for shorter clips where we talk about specific topics. You'll love it. And don't forget to subscribe if you enjoyed our content and you want more.